We've got a great oh, panel here. So late. <laughs> My name is Summer Sood, and I'll be the moderator this afternoon. Uh oh. Let's see. Who's uh, in charge of the audio system? Hello? How about now? Okay. All right. My name is Summer. My name is Summer Sood, and I'll be moderating. We have a great <coughs> panel with us here today. Um, we also have a, a video. We'll be getting to that shortly. So today we're going to be talking about the future of Palestine in an era of extreme right and racist Israel, the role of the Palestinians, the citizens of Israel, and how they are impacted, and what it means for a just and lasting peace. Uh, the excellent panel. So on my left, we have Amal, uh, Amal Gibran, and Amal. she'll... Amal, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Amal Gibran. Yes. <laughs> And uh, she'll be assisting, uh, Ayman Aude sent in a video and she'll be helping us with the translation. Um, next to her is Smadar Lavi. Lavi? Lavi? Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Smadar Lavi is a Mizrahi American Israeli anthropologist. She's specializing in anthropology of Egypt, Israel, and Palestine, focusing on race, gender, and religion, affiliated with the Ethnic Studies Department of UC Berkeley, Lavi recently was the SPATS visiting chair in Jewish studies at Dalhousie University, Canada, and since Levy's outspoken activism resulted in an eight-year-long stop-exit order inside of Israel, she has focused on establishing a feminist anti-racist movements, including Israel's first feminist of color NGO, Ahoti, Am I saying Ahoti. that? Ahoti? Ahoti. Okay. Ahoti. Ahoti. Yeah. She authored The Poetics of Military Occupation, <laughs> receiving the honorable mention of the Victor Turner Award for Ethnographic Writing, and received an honorable mention from the Association of Middle East Women's Studies for Wrapped in the Flag of Israel. Mizrahi Single Mothers and Bureaucratic Torture. Lavi won the American Studies Association in 2009, Gloria and Zaluda. And Zaluda. And Zaldua Prize, and in 2013 won the Heart at East Honor Plaque for Lifetime Service to the Mizrahi Communities in Palestine, Israel. Please help me welcome Thank you. Smadara. <clears throat> yeah, I, will, I also, also wanted to add uh, that in 1984, when I was a student at Berkeley, we started the first divestment campaign in North America, Measure E. And in 2002, I was one of the eight Israelis who signed the first call for academic boycott that came from Hillary and Stephen Rose in England. And then later on, that, that boycott movement morphed into PACB. And I'm going to talk today about the paradox on how you, can you be a right-wing feminist of color in the state of Israel. So my paper analyzes, do you hear me well in the back? My paper analyzes the historical support of Israel's majority citizenry, the Mizrahim, for the state's ultranationalist right through the historical analysis of the relationship between the Zionist movement and Mizrahi women. The state of Israel 50% citizen majority is the Mizrahim, or Jews with origins in the Arab and Muslim world and the margins of Ottoman Europe. The other two segments of Israel's citizenry are the 20% Palestinians with Israeli citizenship and the remaining 30% Ashkenazim, or European Jews of Yiddish-speaking origins. Ashkenazim control the division of power and privilege in the state. It might seem strange for an anthropologist to study the Mizrahi victims of state racism who at the same time espouse right-wing chauvinistic ideologies and practices. Usually anthropologists tend to study subjects they are personally comfortable with, progressive and left-leaning. My work on the racial formation of Zionism reviews the reasons why Mizrahi women in Israel paradoxically support right-wing anti-Arab politics even as they protest against the economic policies of the right-wing government and the state intra-Jewish racism. The main reason Mizrahim support the right is the foundational role of the Zionist left political parties that established and maintained the intra-Jewish racial formation of Zionism from, 19, um, from 1882 
the genesis of Zionism's racial formation was the 1882 importation of Yemeni natural workers to labor for the first wave of socialist Ashkenazi settlers in Palestine. This was the birth of the Ashkenazi Zionist left white privilege. Mizrahim share right-wing stance because they conceive the Zionist left regime as the historical perpetrator of their disenfranchisement. Other reasons stem from the Mizrahi sense of belonging to the Zionist state. This sense often results in Mizrahim setting themselves apart from those who share their phenotype and regional heritage, but who are not Jewish, the Palestinians and citizens of the neighboring Muslim states. In addition these days, entire Mizrahi neighborhoods in the center of Israel are being gentrified and ethnic, ethnically reconstituted because the Ashkenazi real estate bubble of central Israel continues to expand. Buying homes in pre-67 Israel has become completely unaffordable for most young Mizrahim. As the political center keeps moving to the extreme right, the West Bank settlements present one of the few options for newlyweds to become homeowners. The accelerating housing crisis has intensified the unchecked growth of the large urban West Bank settlements near the 48 Arms this line. Middle-aged, middle-class Mizrahim, who gained equity in the real estate bubble of pre-67 central Israel, are selling their home to Ashkenazim. Many parents of young Ashkenazi couples can no longer afford to help their children make a down payment for housing in upper middle class enclaves in Israel's geographic center, so they are buying out the homes of the Mizrahi middle and lower middle classes. Mizrahi parents are dividing the cash from the sales of their pre-67 central Israel homes among their children. This is facilitating down payments for affordable housing in the settlements. The apartheid road system grants settlers a quick commute to pre-67 Israel, where most of their jobs are located. While intra-Jewish racial formations divide Mizrahim and Ashkenazim, the theological binary classification of the world as Jews versus Goim, or non-Jews in Hebrew, which is enemies in Hebrew slang, so it recasts Mizrahim and Ashkenazim as a unified last line of defense for the Jewish homeland, Israel, an ethno-religious state formation perpetually at odds with its neighboring Arab Muslim majority states. Mizrahim are situated between their own economic cultural oppression and the Palestinian fight for national determination. With almost no privileges vis-a-vis -vis the Ashkenazi elite, be it the head of Likud or the shrinking Labour Party, Mizrahim still have the privilege of being Jewish in a state where Judaism defines access to citizenship. If the Mizrahim changed loyalties in the Zionism versus Palestine equation, they would incur immediate losses to whatever gains they have made through the tenuous political economic upward mobility that accompanies their Ashkenazification. Unlike the majority of Mizrahi women, Mizrahi feminists are left-leaning, but they are not a typical minority resistance movement. Mizrahim are a majoritarian group that cannot exercise majoritarian rights. The ruling Ashkenazi minority has racialized and disenfranchised Israel's demographic majority because their white privilege largely defines Israel's mainstream. Mizrahi feminists view Palestinian feminists as kissing ass with well-funded Ashkenazi feminist NGOs who concentrate their activism around the long-term impact of Israel's 1967 occupation of the West Bank and Gaza and on the, Palestinian, on, on the Palestinians and on a hoped-for peace process. Palestinian feminists view Mizrahi feminists as right-wing Arab haters with no funding for joint projects. Nevertheless, no matter which Zionist left party has been in power, it has consistently carried out right-wing domestic social and economic policies. The, the Zionist left initiated Oslo 93 peace economies, economics that outsourced unskilled Mizrahi women's job to the Arab world 
or brought to Israel cheaper third world women to replace them. Even way before Oslo, this left has traditionally held a conservative economic view. Heavily influenced by the ideologies and methods of neocon guru Milton Friedman from 1985 on, this left ushered Israel's privatization and deregulation that led to the disappearance of Israel's racialized, of Israel's racialized version of a welfare, welfare state. The right wing simply followed in lockstep with the left. In addition, the only lasting peace agreement between Israel and any of its Arab neighbors was signed by the right-wing Likud head Menachem Begin in 78. Since 77, Mizrahim vote almost unanimously for the Likud and more recently to Ashkenazi headed ultra-nationalist parties right of Likud. Moreover, it is during the right-wing Israeli regimes that Mizrahi culture as long as it avoids connecting its own Arabness with that of the Palestinians, is promised government funds and embarks on a renaissance. My aim in understanding Israel's normalization of the alt-right is to depart from the usual political perspective, the Israel-Palestine binary. I present a new analytical toolbox challenging the assumptions that the domestic socioeconomic policy policies of intra-Jewish racism and their international aspects of the Israel-Palestine conflict are two distinct domains. I argue that the plight of Israel's Mizrahim and the plight of the Palestinians are complementary. The State of Israel uses war as a unifying force to divert attention from domestic issues of racial and gender justice through the sanctity of its Jewish citizens portrayed as the chosen people in their biblical chosen land, mandatory Palestine. While Mizrahi feminists of color do stage protests against neoconservative restructuring of is in Israel, they cease when Israel undertakes a new cycle of violence against the Palestinians. They do not challenge their community's ultranationalism. As a result of the Jewish state's unity against all goyim, Israel's demographic Jewish majority, racialized and minoritized, increasingly votes for neoconservative authoritarian politicians. The political center keeps moving further to the right. So now let me turn to ethnographic excerpts from my last book to illuminate my argument. Now, this conversation occurred in Mitzpe Ramon. It's a tiny, tiny Mizrahi desert town perched upon a windswept plateau and overlooking a spectacular cirque. Isolated, Mitzpe also has one of the highest unemployment rates in Israel and is a hub of Mizrahi feminism. Our dialogue took place during Israel's 2006 war on Lebanon. Israel's defense minister was Moroccan Labor Party leader Amir Peretz. His election resulted in a large migration of traditional Ashkenazi <coughs> labor voters forming a new party mainly to avoid his leadership. His sister, Flora, was Mitzpah's mayor. So, one evening, Sigal turned to me and asked, how goes your writing? Almost done, thank God for the quiet of the library and your generous hospitality. Anyway, what are you writing about? Ah, the history of Mizrahi women in Palestine during the Yishuv. Yishuv, or settlement in Hebrew, refers to the period of Ashkenazi settlement of Palestine between 1882 and 1948. It's for an encyclopedia on women in, the Muslim, in Muslim cultures. Muslim cultures? Another woman blurted out, do Muslims have culture? I don't know. Why would they care about Jews? Asked another. And why Palestine? Exclaimed third. It's Israel. Why don't you read to us at the end of Tisha B'Av, suggested Sigal. We'll have a potluck and you can lecture. Tisha B'Av is the annual fast day commemorating the destruction of both the first and second temples in Jerusalem. It's a national holiday and a day of fasting. So on 3rd August 2006 at dusk, we gathered at the apartment of Luna, a Tunisian single mothers of, mother of four. Though she was fasting, she could not turn down the hotel's request to show up and work extra hours as so many Ashkenazim from Israel's north used the remoteness of Mitzpah's star-studded eco-resort to escape Hezbollah bombardments from Lebanon. 
Luna was still dressed in her uniform along with a head cover that signified religious observance. A ceiling fan twirled above us and twin fans oscillated in the corners of the room pushing dry hot air. Luna's balcony overlooking the wolf tooth cliff at the Cirque's edge. Partially blocking the view were two frogs, Israel's hulking green painted cast iron dumpsters. As we waited for the sun to set so we, can, we could break the, our fast, the skies alternated mauve, orange, strawberry red, and blurred into gray before black, blackening to night. In the twilight, sickle-horned Nubian <coughs> ibexes sloped elegantly towards the frogs <coughs> to graze on the reeking trash. All of us six women sat in a circle to hear me read. Luna, Varda, Iris, Ortal, and my host Sigal were born in Israel to North African parents. None were originally from Mitzpe. They relocated following their ex-husbands who obtained blue-colored jobs at the IDF officer school nearby, the town's biggest employer. Iris was unemployed, remnant of the IDF uniform sewing plant. Ortal worked as a part-time cook in the officer school. The sixth woman, Ludmila, was an Ashkenazi whose family fled Russia to Azerbaijan after World War II. Because she and her husband technically immigrated to Israel from an Asian republic, the Israeli authorities offered them housing in Mitzpe instead of in the center. She held a job at Mitzpe's elementary school as an hourly data entry worker, but the school had closed for the summer, so she was jobless. In front of this woman, I trembled inside. It was one matter to write an academic book and have other scholars read and comment on it. It was another matter altogether to deliver a talk to real people huddled around you in a hot, stuffy room. These women were my small audience and I wanted to keep things civil. How would these right-wing Likudniks accept my text? It went against the Ashkenazi Zionist credo drummed into their heads in school. I sure hoped they didn't throw me in with the Ashkenazi left peacenik feminists and kick me out of town. Even if I kowtowed to them, could I handle the typical Israeli habit of interjecting an opinion, welcome or not? My text was in English. I had to translate, translate on the fly. Even so, whenever possible, I relied on the terms the women learned in school and carefully interjected new meanings to get my point across. Could I make it to the end? Nevertheless, with pauses and hesitation, I began to read. When I finished reading the AWAC, which is acronym for Encyclopedia of Women in Islamic Culture, <coughs> entry, no one talked. Only the twirl of the fan blades. I felt the women's gaze on me. There were no pages to retreat behind. Unlike the scholars who would read the encyclopedia entry, my audience on that night was staring me in the face. As I translated the text for them, I skipped the portions that they already knew, such as information on the specifics about the kidnapping of Mizrahi babies sold for adoption. The women probably knew more about this than I did. The content that they didn't know so well and what the women thought of it was what caused me to tremble. Averting my eyes, I stared at the half moon knifing through the open balcony door, still anxious and without the post-performance glow. Throughout the talk, the women freely interjected Israel every time I mentioned Palestine. They sparked up argument to protest or support points I raised, using examples from their own lives. To my surprise, my advocate was Ludmila. Let her talk, let her talk, she shushed in her Slavic accented Hebrew, but now, silence. As Luna arrived from the kitchen, she muttered, I don't believe any of it, can't be so bad. Ashkenazim and us, we are all Jews with warm Jewish hearts. Goim, the rest of them. Iris, louder. Yes, it's that bad, it's even worse. They planned it. They run like clockwork. These Europeans, so called and calculated, Ashkenazim. Ashkenazim is the bigoted Israeli slang combining Ashkenazim and Nazis. Iris pronounced it slowly, every syllable a hammer stroke. Troublemakers in Europe back then, troublemakers here right now. How dare you, don't touch my Shoah, exclaimed Ludmila. What chutzpah, were your parents in the camps, she posed. Partisans, she needled. Silence again. Their model is not German. They're socialist, Bolsheviks, Stalinist mentality, Stalinist mentality, Ludmila hissed. I believe everything the professor said because it's just like the Soviet mind. 
Her books are published here, all in Hebrew. That's how you know it's the truth. Ludmila took another pause, suddenly aware of her gushing. The fans rumbled. Jews need to stop being victims. In the Middle East, it's the law of the jungle. All of us here accept it. You don't, she turned to me and pointed. But that's nature, the Jews' right to survive in the jungle. When in war, like, act like it's war. Otal. This Ashkenazi leftist raised her self-esteem, saying, I'm helping the weak, I'm loving the Aravim. Aravim is Arab non-Jews in Hebrew. I'm generous, I'm wonderful. What an ego trip. But what about us? Why do they hate us? They hate us, all right, but advanced us, said Sigal. We no longer, we are no longer Aravim. We no longer veil. No killing daughters for honor. Our men no longer marry several wives. Thank God we live in a Jewish state. So what if the Ashkenazim burst it? Iris. They say they hate us because we vote Likud. Of course we vote for the right. They didn't do these crimes to us. It was a labor <coughs> party and the rest of them left. That's what she lectured about. The Zionist foundational narrative set the scene for the atrocities suffered by Mizrahi women from 1882 on culminating in the kidnapping of their babies to be sold for adoption and unconsented medical ex experimentation. Today, the disenfranchisement, poverty, Arab phenotype, Arab accent, and Arab name discrimination are still integral to the lives of Mizrahi women. Likud screwed with us too, Sigal said, but we must support them. They're not wishy-washy with peace mumbo jumbo. Look here, when the left is in power, there are wars with the Aravim, 48, 56, 67, 73. Even now with Flora's brother, his labor, with Likud and the right, there is quiet. The Aravim are afraid to come out of their cubbyholes. The right doesn't talk peace. They're honest. When in war, act like it's war. After the talk, Sigal and I helped Luna gather her dishes from the table. We then walked back to her apartment we chose a scenic route along the promenade on the edge of the cirque. We ambled, tired from the fast, the large meal, and the arguments. The lopsided moon's rays lit the craggy cliffs above the plateau, but left the cirque's searing depths in thick darkness. The crisp and cool desert breeze came from the north and caressed our southbound backs. Sigal and I said nothing to each other. The sustained silence between us implied neither a deep bond of friendship nor absolute strangerhood. Were we still, still sisters to the struggle? Did she and the others think I was one of those Ashkenazi leftists? Would they abandon Ahoti in our future projects? Would it be my fault? Without warning, Sigal brought it out. Why do you speak in favor of the Aravim? It's over with. Do you really love them? When the time comes and they slaughter us, you won't get a pass because you call yourself an Arab Jew and think you are one of them? They are the enemy. God bless Mitzpeh far away from the Qassam missiles in Gaza, let alone the Hezbollah Katyushas from Lebanon. You know, the missiles can reach Tel Aviv when you and the Shishi sisters leave, but Hamas and Hezbollah won't dare attack. Sorry, it's my dog farting. <laughs> she forced a chuckle. Suicide bombers don't come to Mitzpeh, she continued, stupidly. The media won't come this far to cover them. News has to be within an hour's drive, two hours max. I paused be before answering. I didn't want to start an argument. After all, she was my host. I really don't know. I think we can't separate the Mizrahim from the Palestinians. Sure we can, she shot back. We are Jews, they're going. <coughs> I'm so sorry about that. Yes, okay. Thank you, Smadar. We are actually now, oh, we have a question. I don't justify the Mizrahim. The thing is, yeah. we are Palestinians, yes. and Palestine is occupied by the Zionists, 
Yes. And there are people waiting to go back. Yes. They, they have to go back to their homeland. Yes. But the people talking about migrating the Jews and things like that, that's not justifying what is the right for the Palestinians. I disagree with you on this, because when we think about the binary Israel-Palestine, from a resistance point of view of the Palestinians, you are correct. However, the binary thinking has not lent us any positive results re regarding one state and regarding the right of return. So I am calling for understanding the internal dynamics of Israel for better results to have one democratic state. Because in that one state, there are nowadays one million Ashkenazim who got European Union passports. And they call it Plan B. And they're probably going to go away when there is going to be one state. The people who are going to stay in this one state are the Mizrahim and the Palestinians. So we need to transcend the nationalistic thinking because the nationalistic thinking up until now got us no results. The occupation is, seems to be irreversible. The settlement seems to be irreversible. And if we repeat the old binary script, we're going to get stuck. Like the Sulta is stuck. <coughs> OK, so we have a disagreement. I think we need to think in a different way. Yes, 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 yes. Go ahead and try to make it, uh, you know, like peaceful uh, transition. There is no such a thing as peaceful transition to go ahead at, and coexist. The hatred is too much. Look, there is not going to be a, there is not going to be a peaceful transition. It's going to be a painful surgery. But at the end, after a painful surgery, there's going to be a healing. It's not going to be peaceful. We need to think in real politics here. And the real politics. There is right and there is wrong. OK. OK, so we have a disagreement. No, we have a disagreement. Yeah. yeah. I agree with you on the right of return. I agree with you on one state. But <coughs> we need to think what's going to happen in this one state as far as family law as far as what language they will talk, as far as not gerrymanding the, the, the voting precincts, as far as uh, family unification, as far as cultural ministry, media. We need to think about the practicalities of this one state. And if we think about the practicality of this one state, we need to think about the issue of the Mizrahim as they are turning more and more fascist. So. Thank you, Smadar. Um, I, we have a video uh, to be shown, but we just will go one more question, sir. The question I think is a follow up on the question raised by the gentleman: is that if we do have one state and we want to create one state, that is going to change the very nature that the, of Israel being a Jewish state. It will not be a Jewish state. State, of course. <laughs> and that, neither, I think, I agree with him, no Israeli is going to say, I am an Israeli citizen in a non-Jewish state. Of course. They're not going to agree. Therefore, the question of saying that we're going to create one state where it is non-Jewish state, which, which resembles America, where all religions are on equal footing, that is not going to happen. I disagree with you. Smadar, I disagree I'm gonna let you with you. Respond. I agree with all of what you say about the nature of the one state. But the Ashkenazi elite is not going to stay there. And what I'm thinking is how are we going to make this one state happen so it's secular and democratic and non-Zionist and not Jewish. And in that sense, the Mizrahim will stay there. Where will they go? To Morocco? 
to Yemen, to Iraq, they are staying. And these are the two groups that need to work. And the more time passes and we continue to rehearse and rehearse the Israel-Palestine binary, the more losses those of us who believe in one state are going to incur. Thank you, Smadar. Uh, I believe we have a video. Thank you. <coughs> Say um, why. This Say one. Why. Say um, why. Is it ready? Okay. So, um, Ayman Aude, he's the third speaker um, of the head of the United uh, List recently elected to the Knesset, and he recorded a, a live video message um, for us here. And Amal will be, uh, it's in Arabic, and Amal will be translating for us. أما دائما في إسرائيل نتيجة لإدارة الظهر لإستحقاقات السلام والمساواة والديمقراطية والعدل الاجتماعي وحتى صوت الأسرون خاصة بالمرحلة الأخيرة مما يعمق الأزمة البنيوية الإخوة الكرام في الأي دي سي اللجنة العربية الأمريكية ضد التمييز يشرفني جدا أن أكون معكم ولو عبر هذا الفيديو على أمل أن أكون معكم قريبا بلقاء مباشر بالنسبة لموضوعنا حول الفلسطينيين الذين بطوا في وطنهم رغم النكبة ورغم سياسات التهجير ويقومون بدور سياسي فارغ بالسنوات الأخيرة وبهذه الانتخابات يهمني جدا أن أتحدث معكم أولا الأسباب العميقة لإعادة الانتخابات في إسرائيل هي أزمة بنيوية تتعمق دائما في إسرائيل نتيجة لإدارة الظهر لإستحقاقات السلام والمساواة والديمقراطية والعدل الاجتماعي وحتى سلطة القانون خاصة بالمرحلة الأخيرة مما يعمق الأزمة البنيوية لهذا ليس غريبا أن تعاد الانتخابات حتى للمرة الثالثة هناك إمكانية نحو 50% أن يحدث ذلك بالنسبة لنا نحن أقمنا القاية المشتركة التي تجمع بين الشيوعيين الجبويين اليساريين والقوميين والإسلاميين والليبراليين وهذه وحدة فارقة على مستوى الأمة العربية وعلى مستوى الشعب الفلسطيني الذي للأسف الشديد منقسم على نفسه بين فتح وحماس فصائل غزة الضفة هذا الأمر المؤلم جدا والذي يجب أن يلأم بمواجهة التناقض الرئيسي وهو الاحتلال الإسرائيلي نحن أقمنا وحدتنا هذه ونريد لها أن تتعمق أن تترسم على أساس القيم التي نؤمن بها قيم إنهاء الاحتلال وإحلال السلام قيم المساواة القومية والمدنية قيم الديمقراطية الحقة وقيم العدل الاجتماعي القائمة حصلت على 13 مقعد وعلى 470 الصوت وهو عدد غير مسبوق للمصوتين ومما يثلج القلب كثيرا أن 90% من أبناء شعبنا صوتوا لنا عندما أفكر بهذه المعادلة أقول هذه المعادلة تتحدد دراسات حول مفهوم الهوية والانتماء ماذا يعني أن يصوت مدير قسم في مستشفى رمبان في حيفا وابن قرية بير هداش الغير المعترف بها بالنقر وابن أم الفحم وابن الناصر وابن معليا كل شرائح شعبنا أن يصوتوا بنسبة 90% للقائمة المشتركة هذا معناه هوية معناه انتماء معناه تمكين empowerment تمكين للأقلية القومية العربية ونحن نتحدث بعد 71 سنة من إقامة إسرائيل وسياسة فرق تسود وقبلها بريطانيا وسياسة فرق تسود ونحن نتحدث بعد 10 سنوات من وجود داعش وجبهة النصرة ومحاولات تفريقنا وقتل حقيقي على خلفية الهوية والانتماء بالعالم العربي فليأتي شعبنا بهذا الانتماء الأصيل أن يمارس هذا الانتماء الأصيل بالدعم الكامل للقائمة المشتركة لا شك أن هذا محط افتخار وهذا يحملنا مسؤولية كبرى الأمر الآخر إلى جانب الأبعاد الوحدوية لدى جماهيرنا العربية الفلسطينية هنالك دورنا السياسي العام في هذا البلد أن نلقي بوزننا الكبير من أجل منع نتنياهو من تشكيل حكومة هذا موقف سياسي صحيح في امتياز لماذا؟ 
لأن نتنياهو على شفا أن يمرر صفقة القرق الأمريكية هذا يعني القضاء على المشروع الوطني الفلسطيني ولو إلى حين لماذا أقول إلى حين؟ لأنني مؤمن كبير بشعبنا الفلسطيني وبقضية شعبنا مع كل محاولات قتلها ستبعث من جديد ولكن إذا كان باستطاعتنا منع ضربات تاريخية فلنفعل ذلك ونحن قمنا بهذه المهمة من خلال رؤية سياسية صحيحة أن القضية الأساسية القضية الفلسطينية أن نتنياهو بعلاقته مع الإدارة الأمريكية صفقة القرن نقل السفارة اعتبار الجولان الأرض الإسرائيلية إخراج أمريكا من الاتفاق مع إيران وغيرها من التأثير الإسرائيلي على إدارة ترامب ونتنياهو أكثر رئيس حكومة حرض ضد المواطنين العرب الفلسطينيين داخل إسرائيل لهذا كان هنالك مهمة أساسية حتى لو من باب درء المفاسد أولى من جلب المنافع كان هنالك مهمة أساسية أن نساهم بإسقاط اليمين برئاسة بنيامين نتنياهو هذا الأمر لم يؤدي كليا إلى إسقاط نتنياهو فهو يتأرجح الآن نحن بحاجة إلى مساهمة إضافية من أجل إسقاط ومعه اليمين المتطرف وسنقوم بهذا الواجب كلما سنحت لنا الفرصة أو علينا خلق الفرص من أجل القيام بهذا الواجب أريد أن أقول لكم أننا على المستوى الدولي وعندكم إذا لاحظتوا بالشهر الأخير كنا موجودين بنيويورك تايمز واشنطن بوست بنيويوركير بالفورم بوليسي بعدة وسائل إعلام مركزية في أمريكا وعالمية لا شك أن القائمة المشتركة تجعلنا لا نتحدث فقط باسم أحزاب وإنما باسم مجموعة قومية كاملة هذا الأمر يعطينا قوة عالمية وحضورنا العالمي في السنوات الأخيرة أكثر مما قبل إلى جانب الملاحظة بأن العالم لا يحترم الشكاء والبكاء وإنما المناضل على ترى وطنه يفرض احترامه على العالم لهذا في نضالنا الأساسي هو هنا في الوطن أنا أتحدث معكم من حي وادي مسناس هذا الحي العريق في حيفا مع أهلي الطيبين البسطاء والمناضلين من أجل حقوقهم التواجد مع الشعب البسيط مع أبناء شعبنا بشكل حقيقي بشكل يومي وقيادة نضالات واليوم نحن نقود نضالا مهما ضد العنف والجريمة داخل مجتمعنا اللي أصابع السلطة الحاكمة موجودة فيه بكل مكان ومكان لهذا نقود نضالات جماهيرية نغلق الشوارع الكبرى أكبر شارع في دولة إسرائيل اسمه شارع ستة عابر إسرائيل قبل يومين أغلقناه كليا وسنواصل هذا النضال السلمي ولكن العنيد والمؤثر من أجل أن نعيش بمجتمع صحي مجتمع حضاري كما يليق بأبناء شعبنا أريد أن أقول لكم نحن بحاجة لكم نحن بحاجة إلى هذا التواصل لأن التكامل بين البعد المحلي والبعد الدولي لا شك له نتائج مهمة وبنظرات الشعوب كان أهمية استثنائية للبعد الدولي دائما أقول بعد النضال على أرض الوطن وهو أساس الأساس ولكن بالإضافة إلى ذلك البعد الدولي لهذا نحن بحاجة إلى التكامل فيما بيننا نحن مستعدون لهذا التكامل الآن أتحدث معكم عبر الفيديو يشرفني جدا أن ألتقي معكم بشكل مباشر آمل أن يكون اللقاء قريبا أطلب منكم أن تعتزوا بأبناء شعبكم بانتمائهم الوطني باستعداد للنضال ونحن باقون على العهد أتمنى لكم كل النجاح يعطيكم العافية Dear ADC, dear Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee, it's my honor to be with you today through the internet, hoping to be with you soon. The summary of my message is regarding the Palestinians who stay in the homeland. Some became a refugee at a different area of the homeland. They facing the lower class citizen of Israel colony, facing all kind of fair and unfair as discrimination, rights of dignity and nationality and all kind of rights. <clears throat> Israel coalition leader and the government having a conflict 
forcing Netanyahu to do a second term election in a short month. Our union party was created from a different groups, such as the socialist, the communist, the democratic, the Islamic, and others. But we have one goal, one goal. We do believe to end the occupation, to live in equality and dignity and peace. Israel, for the last 71 years, as Israel colony state of humiliation, unlocking in our youth, fairs, confiscation farms, uprooting homes and villages. But our union party have a goal to block Netanyahu. Yes, Netanyahu and Trump to block them for their idea of the century, century deal and end the occupation, have a life of dignity, right, democratic, <coughs> modern life for us, we deserve. With the latest election, our, uni our united group get 90% of all the people who vote, they vote for our group. And we got the 13 member seat at the Israeli Knesset Parliament. Again, for the last 71 years of Israeli colony state of discrimination, we do teach our new, our new generation, our identification and nationality, we do belong to the land. After 10 years also, of creating and by creating ISIS and in Nusra to divide the Arab nation, the Palestinian nation, and implant conflict and crimes and hate between brotherhood and neighborhood, and by burbing the youth with a lot of guns and hate and crimes and street drugs. We, the Palestinian, at the Israeli state colony, do become united, not as a groups, but as a nation, asking to end the occupation, equal national rights, justice, economic, education, and a freedom of speech, by locking, as I said, Netanyahu goal, and Trump too, blocking the century deal and transport the United States Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, Al-Quds, and to make Trump breaking the U.S. peaceful agreement with Iran and grabbing the Syrian Golan Heights as part of the Israeli colony state. At the end, our Palestinian tragedies is our Palestinian tragedy to all nation with no land becomes strongly spread widely around the world. For example, in your United States, you have it in your media, like as Washington Report in Middle East, New York Times, and others. I am reporting to you here from an old historic community named Wadi Nisnas in Haifa, where the people, native people, have no fear, but full of hope. With the last few days here, we've been calling for free our youth, prisoners from the Israeli jails. We strike, we strike constantly, blocking Road 6 is the main artery between North and South of Israel colony state. I strongly believe in our nation to be united, an Arab country to be united. We need you. We need you, USA. We need you to be 
by building a bridge with us. Between us and you, we can achieve our dignity and peace. Thanks for your time. Hope to meet you soon. Ayman Audi. Thank you, Amal. Thank you, that was great. Um, next, I'd like to introduce you to this fine gentleman on my left. I'm a huge fan. Uh, Nabil Azam was born and raised in Nazareth, Palestine. Sure, He's, sure, sure. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> He doesn't like to. Uh, he he doesn't like hearing all his accolades. He's a longtime activist and frequent speaker on issues related to Palestinian citizens of Israel. Azam is the former president of the Arab American Friends of Nazareth and currently serves on its board. Azam holds a BA in violin and an MA in musicology and a PhD in music. Dr. Azam has established himself as a world-renowned conductor, arranger, and composer, virtuoso violinist, and oud player. He founded Mesto in 2000 with the goal of presenting world ethnic music with the discipline of Western classical music. He has astonished audiences across the United States and the Middle East with his original compositions and impeccable orchestrations of works by artists from all over the world, which showcase his mastery in both Western, classical, and Middle Eastern music styles. Mastro Azam was honored in 2015 at the Cairo Opera House and was awarded the prestigious Palestinian Medal of Culture science and arts of highest degree from President Mahmoud Abbas. Welcome, Dr. Azam. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And, <laughs> and now uh, you see how I failed in music, maybe I'm trying politics, maybe <laughs> it will be better for me. Good evening. <clears throat> uh, yes, um, <clears throat> knowing that I'm coming to uh, talk about the latest development, the latest um, uh, election in, in Israel, I um, alerted my good friends and um, wanted to think about this. This is the Alex Audi um, conference. So this is Ayman Audi. Yes. So I called him, I said, Ayman, please do me a favor, help me, help out. And so he re recorded this and he sent it today, okay? And the other uh, person that I consulted with was the uh, Audi Bsharat, so all of the Ayman and Audi and Audi and Audi. And the uh, Audi Bsharat is a columnist, is a very, very well-known columnist in, in Haaretz. He writes in Hebrew every Sunday. Uh, uh, his article appears in, in the uh, Haaretz newspaper and he has big, huge fans. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, Hebrew readers of Haaretz, which is the highest um, uh, uh, newspaper for the intelligent people in, help me out. Left wing. Uh, in <laughs> Israel. Ashkenazi. It's Ashkenazi, exactly, yeah. So I consulted with, with them, and um, uh, Audi Bsharat sent me the uh, outlines. I am going to spare you all of this um, uh, history and, and um, uh, the timeline of, of the things happened. Let me talk about the 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 party that Ayman Audi represents, it's a, it's a 13, today, it's a 13 uh, members of 120 Knesset members uh, of the Israeli parliament, 13 today. Uh, they are the third largest party in the Knesset. Um, the largest party is uh, not for Netanyahu, the largest party is for uh, Benny Gantz, that uh, he, he gained 33 uh, seats no, not Labour. No, Kahol Avan. No, no, Kahol Avan. Blue and white. The blue and white. Blue and white. Uh, uh, Netanyahu got 32 for his party. And Ayman Audi and the Arab uh, uh, United uh, uh, Arab um, uh, parties are 13. And so they are the, the third largest party in the Knesset. What is the problem? The problem of this uh, election comes from the fact that um, neither Gantz or Netanyahu are able to form a government today. Government today. The reason why um, the president of Israel did not give, he gave Netanyahu the, uh, 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 um, the go ahead to go and try to form the government is because Netanyahu came, came to the president of Israel with his gang, with 55 people who recommended him to the president, 55 and he forced them to sign an agreement that they are united, they are, and he is the spokesman for these 55 
members of the Knesset. What happened was, with Gantz got 33, one more than, uh, than Netanyahu, but when the parties went to recommend uh, uh, their own um, candidate to form the government, for the first time, and this is uh, unprecedented, because every time the Arab parties go to the president, meet with the president after every election, but they uh, uh, sustain, they, they don't recommend any of the, of the uh, candidates. This time, this time, Ayman and his friends got <coughs> 13 uh, uh, members of the Knesset, they, uh, they tried to play the game differently. They went to the president and they recommended guns. They have to choose between two evils. Don't misunderstand me. Two evils. Okay? I'm, I'm talking passionately about this because the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, recommending guns is not recommending an angel. He's a general. He, he, he killed people in Gaza. Thousands of them. I'm, I'm not talking about... I'm, I'm not um, uh, 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 recommending gun, but because of the, in the uh, election uh, propaganda, uh, um, uh, they were saying, Ayman and his friends, by all means, get, uh, get rid of, of Netanyahu. So what happened is that they went to the president and they recommended guns. And they told the president, it's the choice of two, two evils. Uh, but when they came home, and, and he, then by then he had 57 people to recommend him. 57 people, two more than Netanyahu. But what happened when they went home, three of the 13s said, no, we don't want to, to recommend guns. Not only that, he went from 57 to 54, which one less than Netanyahu, but guns wasn't even thankful. He said, because you know, Arabs, are, 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 are monsters in Israel. You cannot say, I want to make a coalition with the Arabs. You will lose your, your constituency. So he recommended them. I mean, he was able to be on top of the game, but he did not thank the Arabs. He said, you, you uh, hurt our, our mission. So anyway, that's why uh, Netanyahu is trying now. He will fail. The decisive factor on all of these um, elections are Lieberman. Mm -hmm. Lieberman is, uh, he's a, a newcomer to Israel. He came to Israel in 1978. He was in the Knesset, a member of Knesset in 1998. He was a member of the Knesset. At one, at one time he had 15 members of Knesset under him, if from Russia. Did I say from Russia? He came, uh, migrated from Russia. Anyway, so uh, to make the long story short, you don't have time. Today he has eight uh, people in his party, eight members of the Knesset, and he could make it or break it. And he, everyone knows that. Everyone knows that. And he will never go with Netanyahu in one coalition that will include the Orthodox Jews because they betrayed him at one point in the past. So this is out of, out, out of the question. No matter what, he said no. He will not go with guns because his ideal is to have a, a unit, uni, unity government for, to unite all the big, the big uh, uh, parties. And of course, he will be uh, one and with the rotation in the, uh, between Netanyahu and Gantz. What I learned today you know, from one of my great friends, Lazir Mjalli, is another columnist that um, that the issue of um, uh, uh, Lieberman is very, very acute. And he will not, because, because he's against Arabs, Arabs for him are monsters, Arabs for him are the betrayer, betrayals of Israel, Arabs are not to be even considered. And Arabs for Lieberman are temporary uh, visitors in this country. So here you go. No, no way out, and no way without the Arabs, and the Arabs are marginalized, and then the Arabs, I'm talking about the Arabs, you know what I mean, uh, are uh, decided to play the game differently, as Gans decided to play the game differently in 19, uh, uh, 
2015 when, when they said, hey, enough with the Likud uh, rain. We want to change this uh, Likud, uh, Likud uh, uh, governing Israel. We want to form a new government, a new, uh, um, a new party. That's why they united with uh, 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 Yalon, Lapid, and Gantz. All of them generals, by the way. It, it's known. I mean, they, they said the generals should, should uh, govern Israel. And so here we go, deadlock. Uh, decide, uh, uh, Ayman and his friends are playing the game differently. They want to change from the inside, and they want to, they want to be part of this game. Yes? Thank you, thank you, Lily. Yeah, they're telling the going that Let's, we are a democratic country. Thank, thank you, Lily. You know what? We're going to take questions. I'm just going to raise one question for the panel, uh, Mr. or Dr. Azam. Uh, and this is a perfect. Thank you, Lily. It's a perfect segue into the question. Since 1992, the Arab parties in Israel enacted a policy not to support any Israeli candidate for office, no matter what party. Last month, Ayman Ade broke that tradition to present a new approach, and he recommended that the blue and white leader, as Dr. Azam has mentioned, Benny Gantz, receive the mandate to establish a coalition. Um, can you talk to us about this and explain whether or not you think that this is, and it goes back to what Lily was discussing, if you think this is the right move to take, a more for us Palestinians to take a more proactive approach in engaging in coalition politics. Well, there are two schools here, and both of them, I heard them, I heard the two schools from, from childhood. If you want to fight Israel, if you want to destroy Israel, go ahead. Why do you don't need to ask any permission from anyone? But if you live there, you have two choices, either to be or not be, either to live or not live. It's, it's a personal choice. And as I said, the, the Arab Unite uh, uh, Party, it shows between two evils. They all know two evils. Gantz is not better than Netanyahu. 
but the idea was to get Netanyahu down. And, and today I learned from uh, 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 Nazir Mjalli, he put it in numbers. <laughs> Netanyahu is playing with, with days and weeks. How many days he has to still to form the government, which he will not, 11 days. And then, then the president will give the mandate to Gantz. Gantz will have 28 plus 14 days. And as today, the pres uh, Prime Minister of Israel is, is, is Netanyahu. And he will stay not, uh, Prime Minister as Gantz is trying to form the government. Gantz will, will, will fail, right? And he will have another vacuum of another uh, one month. And then they will call for elections. And this is already three months, right? And the elections will take preparation two months, and then this five, six months. And then in three more months, they will held the third round of elections. Hey, he got it. Now, Netanyahu is trying to avoid jail. Netanyahu jail. is trying to avoid the yeah. indictment of his own allegations against corruption, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he will stay, just hold one second, he will stay a, a prime minister for another eight months if if he will not invent another war. He will. In no. Gaza. He might. Yes. He might. You wage a war, you stay prime minister. He doesn't, uh, uh, Netanyahu does not care about how many people will die. He cares about himself. We all know that. In, in, the, in, in 2015, I heard him on TV. He was barking at the malls, at the, at the, at the beaches. Arab, he was of course lying. Arabs are flocking to the polls to vote in order to scare his own people. Go vote, go vote, because the Arabs are, 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 are no harim. They are flocking to, to, to vote. It was a big lie. Turns out to be that that time, it was the lowest rate of Arabs in Israel, Palestinian and Israel voting. This time, this time he invented something else. These, he pointed at us, are killers of our soldiers and our children. He was saying that, imagine if it was happening in the, in the, in the United States. He was saying that Arabs and the Palestinians are the killers of, of our soldiers and, and citizens and, and children. Turns out to be the Arabs understood him, they understood his tactics and dynamics, and they went up voting for the United Arab Thank you very much. Thank, Can yes, I thank you. This? Sure, please. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll take your question. Yeah, I, I, I wanna. I see the situation like you, Nabil. I wanna add two things. One of them is factual. The other is poetic. As far as factual, if you look at the way Palestinian civilians lose their lives to the IDF. Usually, it starts with civil unrest between Mizrahim and Ashkenazim. Then, to turn down the civil unrest, there is a war, usually in Gaza, or there is a Mivza operation. Not a in, war, attack. Uh, yeah, it's carnage. Mm. I mean, I don't have Genocide. any other, yeah. yeah. Genocide. And then, after that, the Knesset disbands, usually over the budget, and then there are elections, and the center moves to the right. And because the center moves to the right, there is more tension between Mizrahim, or the Lampen, and Ashkenazim, or the elite. And then there is another war. And after that war, the Knesset disbands. After the Knesset disbands, there are elections. This time we're going to through three rounds. And, and, and if you, you look at it, no, okay. in recent year, I mean, since the Rabin assassination, Israel doesn't have a regime stability. And Again, what I'm bringing to the table is to connect the Israel-Palestine, Israel-the Arab world with the internal strife in Israel. And that brings me to the second point, which is poetic. One of my most favorite books ever is Baba Shams by Elias Khoury. And while Baba Shams talks about the story of Yunus, who always says, Min al -awwal, we always restart, we will struggle. There is one character there who is a very cynical Palestinian exile intellectual who works in the archives. That's where uh, Khoury himself worked, in the Palestine archives. And that character, they have all of these intelligentsia parties in Beirut. And that character always says, if Israel will go, 
It's not going to go by explosion. It's going to go by implosion because of Israel's internal problems. And that's our hope because externally we can't do it. And in that sense, the implosion will happen when the civil strife can no longer be remedied by a war. And all of the recent news, all of what Netanyahu is saying is basically because there is so much civil unrest now, and I'm on order to my mind is very smart to get into the implosion scheme because there can't be an explosion practically. So I'm an order on the one hand and other activists on the other, like the New Black Panthers, they are working from various directions which are transcending the nationalist discourse to bring about this implosion. And go back to Baba Shams and look at this very cynical intellectual and what he says is a prophecy. Thank you, Smadan. Did you have a question? Yes, I have a statement. Please. The old Palestine. Or, you know, whatever, you know, because they, you know, and then another thing, what's happening here, this forum turned to be how we can save Israel by making the Arabs, you know, to have equal rights with the Jews. That's all what we're talking about. There are Palestinians other than the Palestinians inside, inside, inside the occupied land. You know, we have to look after those people. We don't look at the existence. Everything is Israel, Israel, Israel. Let's stop doing that. We are here to talk about the Palestinians. Right to return. Thank you. About the, uh, about the Thank you. So uh, yes, with that, uh, with yeah, no, very good, very answer. nice. Very I, 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 I was contacted. Yes. I was contacted to talk about the latest yeah. elections. Yes. Uh, that's if you have. Any uh, complaints uh, for Nabil uh, uh, Muhammad and, and the ADC? Not, not. So, in your opinion, I, I how, want to answer this. One second. Yeah. In your opinion, Dr. Azam, yeah. how, how should Palestinian leadership and the civil society and the activists among you here and there, how do you, what's your opinion how they should engage in this context? In the conflict? In the context of what Aude is doing, what he's speaking to. I don't know. We tried it. We are trying. Palestinians are trying in Gaza, in, in, in Gaza, in the West Bank. The Arab world is, is in, in rubble. It's not easy to even to say, Palestinians, who, who are we? What are we doing? We are scattered. We are not united. We have... Can you believe we have two governments, one in Gaza, one, one in the West Bank? How? How, how, how is that possible? Because Abbas is... And sorry. how is that possible when the, uh, the, the, the 71 uh, young Palestinians, Arabs in, in, in South of Israel, were killed by Arabs in, in only, only this year, from the uh, uh, beginning of the year until now? And they are killing, uh, are uh, going on every day. I, hey, we, we don't know what to do with ourselves. Israel is selling, is selling weapons to the, to the Arabs, and the Arabs are buying it to kill Arabs. Not even one Israeli was killed. And drugs. Huh? And drugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Excuse me? Yes. Have you ever thought that they are not Arabs, they are Mustarid, Mustarid, Mustaridin, and they are killing, killing us? You know, they are the ones Israel is killing. Possible, possible. Yeah. Possible. So let's, I want stop, go, let's stop. Possible. I want to Okay, good. Thank you. I, I want to I answer this. All right, let's let Before Esmadar, it, yeah. go ahead. She uh, had, and then we'll take uh, yeah. some questions. We're running behind, so yeah. Esmadar. I have some optimism to give you. And that we, the anti-Zionist Mizrahi activists, wish we had four segments like the Palestinian people. There are the Arab Tamanya Warbain, the 48 Arabs. There are the Palestinians in the West Bank in Gaza. There are Palestinians in the refugee camps, the ones you talked about, in, in, in the Arab world. And then there are Palestinians like yourself here in the West or in Latin America. And despite the disagreement, there is a certain concert, 
Sometimes it's harmonious, sometimes it's dissonantic, but look how, what a wonderful way the struggle for a free and independent Palestine has done from 67, from the beginning of the AAUG until now. Because AAUG started as a response to 67. So what I'm telling you is that you need to let each part of these four parties, they work in contrapunct. They don't work like a melody and chords. And the melody is Palestine, Israel, the binary, and the chords are clapping hands. When you do a counterpoint or contrapunct in classical music, each party has its own music, its own tactics, its own strategy. And at the end, like a braid, it gets woven. And in that sense, whenever we meet and get together, we are so envious of you that you are successful in doing it. And we can't. Um, Can I just make, uh, I want to thank you, Did you want to? Yes, did you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, we need, to, we're running behind, but we just have a, a question up here. She, go ahead. And to go on top of that, like I wanted to ask a question, I don't know if we have time, but I wanted to even address discrimination against Ethiopian Jews in Israel. Because and that's, Israel yeah. is incredibly unstable, and to think that the unequal distribution of resources will ever favor a Palestinian in the prison, the way in which they just don't, they don't even allow construction in Gaza, let alone anything else to build a community and organize and that that speaks to what Smadar was saying earlier in terms of in the implosion. Not, yeah. not an explosion, but it's yeah. going to be an it's, implosion. It, it, it and that's just away, one. If yeah. the Zionist entity is to depart from this world, it's going to be by implosion, not by explosion. The elite is leaving. The elite is leaving. And that's why we Thank need to you. have alternative scenarios. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Yeah. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Amal. I had short notice. Yes, I know. Thank you so much. You did wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. You did great. Thank you. Congratulations. I think you have the right attitude. And I don't think the gentlemen understand that the only way it